we outline several practical ways in which we can be generous with our finances, tithes and offerings, support of Christian ministries and organizations, gifts to bless other people, and alms we give to help the poor and needy. All right, so what have we been talking about lately? <laughs> so we've been talking about generosity. Right? Uh, last Sunday, uh, we started uh, talking about generosity, about giving, and this Sunday we're just going to continue on a little bit on that, uh, wrap it up. We spoke about the spiritual side of things last Sunday, today. We want to just talk about the practical side of things. Now, Again, the same disclaimer, uh, we're not talking about generosity because we are in a desperate re- need for money or we're going to take up an offering or something like that. No, we're just speaking about it because it's an area that all of us is, as believers uh, need to grow, need to continue to be faithful in and understand what we're doing and do it uh, with the right intent and right motives. So we're just bringing this as a way of reminder, uh, not because uh, necessarily there's a need Uh, to take up money right now. Uh, So as we talk about generosity, the practical side of giving, uh, I just want to remind us that, you know, giving can be expressed in many, many different ways. We can give in many ways. Uh, We can give through finances. uh, That is our money. Uh, We can also give through our time. I think for all of us, time is is of a premium. At best, I, by mistake, I said for some of us, and then it's, oops, no, it's for all of us. <laughs> time is a premium. It's really important. We value uh, time, and time represents a part of our life because we could have used that time for something else to, you know, do something. It represents us. It represents a part of who we are. And so when we give our time to somebody, when you go, you know, spend an hour with somebody, talking to them, listening to them, whatever, you're giving, you're being generous. You're, that's an expression of generosity. You can give material possessions. Uh, you can bless people with material things. Uh, you could also be generous in hospitality. You can provide food. You could, uh, you know, just welcome people in your home. Uh, you can also be generous in your skill. And some of us, uh, with our skills, we also are, are give our skills voluntarily, freely uh, for the work of God. You know, people who are serving in worship or uh, in church are doing so many different things. Uh, they are giving off their skill to bless people, to serve people. And uh, that's, again, another way uh, to be generous, to give. And there are several other ways. You can give encouragement, compassion, so on. Uh, And so uh, while we understand that generosity can be expressed in many different ways, uh, our focus in this two-part series is on finances, of, of, of being generous in giving our money, our finances. And so... In, in the practical side of how you and I as believers can be generous and, and how, we, how we can give, I want to just talk about these few areas of giving that we find in Scripture. And I've just given you know, uh, uh, titles uh, that would help us communicate it so it doesn't, this, these are not rigid. That means this is not, you can title it differently if you want. So uh, our giving can be in these areas, tithes. And offerings, which is what you give to your local church. Support, which is what you give financially to other Christian ministries and organizations. Gifts, what you give to other people to bless their lives. Uh, It doesn't necessarily have to be somebody in need. It's just somebody you you want to bless. You give gifts. And alms or charity, which you give necessarily purposely or intentionally intentionally to meet the needs of somebody who does not have, who is in need at that time you give. So we find these different kinds of givings uh, in Scripture. I want to talk br- briefly about each of these. So tithes and offerings. Are you all with me or you're deciding to go home now? It's like, no, this message is for everybody else. <laughs> no. So tithes and offerings. A tithe is simply... of your income, right? So you, for most of us, we have a monthly salary. So it's a 10% of what you earn. For some of us who may have other other ways of means of income, uh, if it's not as regular as a monthly income, whatever, but 10% of what you receive, you give and you set aside. And we typically say 10% of your gross income out before you pay your taxes, you calculate your tithe. And that 10%, uh, you give 
to God. You bring it to your local church. Offerings are anything above your tithe, anything that you give beyond your tithe. Now, what we believe and what we encourage people to do is to give their tithes and their offerings to their local church. The local church that you're a part of, you bring your tithes and your offerings there. And I'll explain why we say that as we go along. But uh, we want to just do a quick overview of tithes and offerings, uh, tithes in, in the Bible. The first person that we see recorded in Scripture who gave tithes is Abraham. Abraham, we find in, in, in Genesis, the 14th chapter, he had just gone off into a battle. He'd won a battle. Uh, he'd got a lot of, uh, he and his soldiers, of course, they'd got a lot of uh, exploits from the battle. On the way back, they met this man, Melchizedek. He was a priest and a king. And Ab he blessed Abraham, and Abraham gave a tenth of what he had received, what he had collected out of his battle, he presented it to Melchizedek. So that's the first person we record. Uh, we see recorded in scripture, who gave a tithe, who gave a tenth of what he had obtained. The next person we see record, uh, on record in the Bible who gave a tenth or who promised to give God a tenth was Jacob. Jacob, as he was running away from home, he has his encounter with God. Uh, and, and then when he wakes up in the morning, he realizes, you know, God has met him in a very unusual way. And Jacob, in Genesis 28, verse 22, he says this, Lord, if you will bring me back to my people, I will give a tenth of all you bless me with. I will give it to you. So Jacob was the second person we find recorded in Scripture. Then after that comes Moses, who brings the law, what we call as the law, or the Mosaic law, the law he brings in to the people. That now covered the entire nation of Israel, the entire Jewish people. He gives them the ten, uh, the, the law, the, what we call as the law of Moses. And as part of the law, God instructs his people to bring the tithe. And I'll just reference one verse, one, um, two verses here in Leviticus 27, verses 30 and 32. God tells his people, and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock or whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. So basically, you know, in those days, their, their wealth really was defined by the produce of the land and by their livestock. So what God is saying is, tenth of the fruit of your ground, of, of the farm, farming, and the tenth of your livestock, first, it belongs to God. He says, it is the Lord's. And second, it is holy to the Lord. So the tenth belongs to God. So God instituted this. Now, as you read it through other passages in the Old Testament, and I'm not going to have us read that, but I'll summarize it. What they had to do was God's people had to bring a tenth of the produce of the land or of their livestock. They had to bring it to the house of God, the temple. So they didn't take it anywhere else. They took it to the temple, the house of God. And uh, the primary reason for the tithe was to take care of those who served in the temple. They were the Levites, <coughs> excuse me, they were the Levites and the priests. The Levites were the caretakers of the entire temple and, uh, you know, they helped in all the proceedings of the temple. The priests, of course, uh, they, they served God and they served people. So the Levites received the tithes from the people. At the time they received, a tenth of that was then given to the priests. So the priests and the Levites lived of the tithes. Are you with me? So that was the whole purpose, that God set this thing in motion. Now, the Levites and priests had no possession in the land. That means they had nothing outside. So this was their means of livelihood or this is how they lived. By the tithes and offerings that were brought into the temple by the people, they lived off of that. So that was what God set in motion. You'll read about this in Numbers, the 18th chapter, uh, you, if, you, if you would like to do that. Now, what we also see is that the other offerings, the sacrifices, other things, they brought, they brought it to the temple. They gave it in the house of God. And it was used in the service of God to take care of the Levites and the priests. Whenever there was a revival in the land, one of the things that was restored was the bringing in of the tithes and the offerings to the temple. How can you say there was revival? Well, people started bringing in tithes and offerings. They started giving in to the house of the Lord. Are you with me so far? All right. Now, 
One of the most well-known passages about tithing and tithes and offerings is in Malachi. So everyone knows that. Let's go to Malachi chapter 3 and we'll read this passage. Malachi chapter 3 verses 8 through 12. I just want you to see what God is saying, you know, uh, the way he puts it across and, and what he promises. Malachi chapter 3 verses 8 through 12. God says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Now, that's kind of funny. I mean, who can rob God? I mean, God owns it all. He owns everything. And yet God looks at it this way. That when we hold back our tithes and offerings, He's looking at it as though we are robbing God. Who? He says, will a man rob God? And they say, God, in what way have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? And so what has happened consequently, the next verse, verse 9, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. See, instead of having blessing come on you, withholding the tithes and offerings have only opened up uh, this nation, they opened up the people to things that should not be upon them. It's not God in, God's intent for them uh, to come under a curse. But because they've withheld the tithes and offerings, this has come upon them. So what does he say? Verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. So bring it to the temple. So this is why we say your tithes, your offerings should go to your local church. It's very clear as we see the pattern set for us in the Old Testament. Bring it to the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. Now, who's going to eat this food? Not God's. Right? There may be food in my house, meaning there's a means to help people do the work in the house of the Lord. Now, there may be food in my house. Of course, the priests and the Levites, they're going to live off of this, and they're going to do the work in the house of the Lord. That's what God is saying. You bring it in so that the work in the house of the Lord can continue. And notice what he says. And try me now in this. Let me try it out. If you've never done it before, God is okay with you trying this. Try it out. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to see. So God is saying, I'm going to bless you in such a manner you will not have room to contain the blessings I pour out on your life. So that's what he's saying. So you bring the tithes and the offerings. You bring it into the house of the Lord. I'll open you the windows of it. I'll pour out such a blessing. And not only that, what will I do? Verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. So that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the wine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. The devourer coming to destroy your work. So imagine in those days. They did farming or livestock. That's what they did. And God says, you know, I will protect the work you do. The devourer will not destroy it. Now, in our day and time, we may not be, you know, those of us in the city, not engaged in farming or uh, taking care of cattle. But our work may be in offices and in other areas. But yet God says, I will protect your work so that the destroyer will not destroy the fruit of your work. Amen. I will protect what you do in your workplace. Make sure that you enjoy the fruits of your labor. And then verse 12, nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land. People will see how God has blessed you, and nations, people around you will call you blessed. Amen? So, this passage just clearly uh, reveals to us God's heart here concerning tithes and offerings. That you bring your tithes to the house of the Lord, and God says, I will do this for you. Now, in my own personal life, I started tithing at the age of 13. At the age of 13, now thank God for the Methodist Church. I was growing up in the Methodist Church, and one great thing they taught us to do in VBS was uh, we used to attend vacation Bible school. For those of you who don't know what VBS is. <laughs> and in the Methodist Church, during VBS, they taught us you do some work in your house, you earn some money, and you come and give it in church. I thank God they taught us that. So I said, I'm going to polish my dad's shoes. My dad's probably watching online. So he can say amen to that. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to polish my dad's shoes. And when I started, I used to charge only 50 paisa. Okay? 
per pair, right? And then after a few months, I increased it to one rupee. Right? But that's what I did. And I continued, you know, till my 12th standard when I was living in Bangalore. So from my 8th standard till 12th standard, every morning, or almost every morning, and dad was home, I used to polish his shoe. I'd write it in my notebook, 50 paisa. Some days I polished two pairs because in the evenings he went uh, for meetings. So he'd wear another pair, polish, 50 paisa. <laughs> End of the month, I'll collect my money. Now, you can imagine, it probably would not have been more than 30 rupees. Not more than 30 rupees. But I was so proud to bring that 5 rupees on the first Sunday of the month and put it in the offering. 3 rupees my tithe, 2 rupees extra. Tithes and offering. 5 rupees. Now, of course, my parents gave me a lot of money to do other things. But this was money I earned. It was not given to me. I earned. I polished you. I earned. So that five rupees, even though it was small, for me, I said, God, Malachi 3, 8 to 10, bring the tithes. God, I'm bringing my tithes. And you promised you will open the windows of heaven. You will pour out on me a blessing. Amen? Now, when I went to college, my dad used to send me the monthly uh, allowance. First thing, I think it was 80, 800 rupees. This is outside, you know, the mess fees and all. 800 rupees for living. 80 rupees I'll keep aside, my tithe. I'll put it to the house of God. When I went to the U.S., I was on assistantship. In those days, we had $800 assistantship, stipend. $80 set aside, my tithe. Never failed to give my tithe. Whatever stage of life... At home as a student, in college as a student, started working, of course, you know, you give your time. But I can tell you when I look back, God has been faithful to his word. Yes, there have been some time, some periods of life and things are a little challenging, but God has always been faithful. One thing I've learned, and I like to say it like this, that he will give you more than what money can buy. He'll give to you more than what money can because he said, I will open for you the windows of heaven. I will pour out on you such a blessing. You won't have room enough to receive it. You want to have room? So I, I know. I, I mean, I, I don't want to tell you all the number of years. But all these decades, <laughs> I have been faithful in giving time. And I can tell you, God is faithful on his side of this whole verse. You do your part. You bring the tithes and offerings. God is faithful on the other side. He will make sure that he will pour out on you such blessing. You don't have room enough to receive it. And I remember when I was going through college, uh, there would be times I'll go to God on behalf of these, uh, with these verses. I'll say, God, you know, I've been faithful to give my tithe. And I'm asking you to pour out these blessings. I could do that. Why? Because you've done your part. Now you can go to God and say, God, I'm expecting you to do your part. And he's faithful. Amen? Now, um, some, sometimes people say, you know, well, tithing is only in the Old Testament. Uh, why we Christians uh, in the New Testament, we don't need to tithe. I will give you three quick reasons why, as believers in the New Testament, why we tithe. First of all, tithing was practiced by people of faith even before the law. Abraham, like we mentioned, Abraham and Jacob tithed. They didn't tithe because of the law. They tithed because of their faith in God. Because the law only came out with Moses. And the Bible says you and I are descendants, spiritually, of descendants of Abraham. So hey, if the father of faith tithed as an expression of his walk of faith, shouldn't you and I do it? It's not about the law. Tithing is not a law thing. It's a faith thing. That you are believing God. That if you release your 10% and more. That you, he will help you take care, of, uh, take care of you. With the rest that you have. It's a faith thing. Not a law thing. Secondly. Even the Lord Jesus spoke about giving the tithe. This is Matthew 23, 23. Of course he was rebuking the Pharisees in this verse here. And because they were giving tithe of all the little things. But they forgot to do the things of uh, justice, mercy, and faith. And Jesus says, you should do 
justice, mercy, faith, but you should also do the other thing. Keep giving the tithe. So Jesus approved that. And lastly, the third reason that I, I say that believers we give tithe is because of what we see in Hebrews chapter 7. That even in, in the New Testament, the writer of Hebrews is, is drawing a comparison. And I'll just like to read that passage for us and then just bring out this uh, insight from that. Hebrews 7, we'll read verses 1 through 10. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. So remember, Abraham was the first person recorded to give tithe. The writer of Hebrews is referring to that incident. And he says, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First being translated king of righteousness and also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. So he's saying Melchizedek was the king of righteousness. He's also king of peace. And uh, then he says, Verse 3, without father, without mother, without genealogy, have a ne having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. So what he's saying is, Melchizedek is a type of Christ. No beginning, no ending. He's continuing as a priest. So what Abraham did in giving a tithe to Melchizedek, Melchizedek is a type of Christ. You and I are descendants of Abraham. So this is a continuing thing. It's not a one-time thing. It continues. And then we can read on verse 4. Now consider how great this man was, that is Melchizedek, to, he, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, now he's talking about the Levites under the Mosaic law who were receiving tithes, who receive the priesthood, having, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law. That is from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them, that's Melchizedek, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there, that is Melchizedek, he... Melchizedek receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. So under the law, men, the Levites receive tithes. But he's saying there is something that's continuing. The priesthood of Melchizedek continues. Melchizedek was only a type. Jesus is the real. And he says that priesthood continues. Are you with me? The Levitical priesthood stopped as far as you and I are concerned. But the priesthood of Melchizedek continues. Jesus Christ is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a type. Christ is a reality. That continues. So if Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek, we can state clearly that as New Testament believers, we give tithes to Jesus Christ. Jesus receives our tithes today. We finish this passage. Verse 7, now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he, Melchizedek, receives them on whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. For he was still in the loins of his, of his father when Melchizedek met him. So even the Levites gave tithes because they were descendants of Abraham. So this is another reason why, the third reason why, I believe New Testament uh, Christians also as, uh, give tithes. You and I give our tithes and offerings. You all with me so far? Yes? All right. Let's go to the second type, uh, second category of giving, which is support, which is you giving to other Christian ministries and organizations. Uh, so when, if you want to, out after you've given your tithes and offerings, you would like to support uh, other people who are doing God's work, uh, we encourage you to do that. An example we see in Philippians 4, 15 to 19, that uh, Paul writes to the Philippians how that uh, from the beginning of the gospel, when he left Macedonia, they were the only ones who, who supported him. Uh, verse 16, even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessity. So they were supporting Paul as a traveling minister. Verse 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. So when you give, the fruit of it comes back to you. You're giving to support a ministry, or giving a minister of God. God uh, Paul is saying that fruit will come back to you. In the, uh, verse 18, in the, indeed I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, 
a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice and well-pleasing to God. When you give to God, it's a sweet-smelling sacrifice. It's an aroma that's pleasing to God. And then verse 19, my God will supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So God will take care of your needs as you give to support his ministers. So what I'd encourage all of us to do, and I'm not going to tell you whom to give and where to give, but as God puts on your hearts, you can decide to support other Christian ministries or ministers, individuals or organizations. You can give as, as God puts it in your heart. Are you with me? And also I do want to make mention that when you give here to the church, part of what you give goes out to other Christians, to other churches, other ministries, in missions. Uh, it goes out to bless people across the country. So in any case, some of your giving is going out in this manner as well. And it goes out across the nation to bless God's people uh, around the country. The third area of giving is gifts. That is, you just give gifts to bless somebody. You know, God just moves, put somebody on your heart. You say, hey, I just want to bless you with this. It could be money. It could be, you know, in, in kind, how you want. God just put something. But learn to do that. Learn to just bless people. Not necessarily because they have a need, but just because you want to bless them. Just give into their lives. Bring a smile on their lives, on their faces. Just bless them. Right? You read about this in Galatians 6 verse 10. It says, as we have opportunity, do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so other believers. Just bless them. And Hebrews 6 verse 10 says, God is not unjust. He doesn't forget your work or your labor of love, but you've shown towards his name. In that you have ministered to the saints and do ministry. You share, you serve other believers through this. And again, we don't dictate whom you give and how much you give in this area. It's entirely up to you, but try it out. Try being a blessing to other believers. And lastly is arms. That is, you're giving to specific needs. Those who don't have for themselves, you're giving. Uh, somebody who is in need, you bless them. You give financially into their needs. Uh, uh, Jesus said, talked about this in Matthew 6 verses 3 and 4. He said, when you do a charitable deed or alms, you're giving something uh, to the poor. Don't, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Let your charitable deed, uh, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. See, for each one of these givings, there is a reward. For the tithes and offerings, God says there's a reward. For you giving to other ministries, it says the fruit will be added to your account. For you blessing other believers with gifts, he said God is, will not forget your labor of love. He will not forget it. He will reward it. Arms, he says a father who sees you in secret, he will reward you openly. So every form of giving is going to position you to receive a blessing on your life. Amen? So, in your finance, in, in, as you order your finance and think about giving, think about these different ways in which you can give to demonstrate generosity. And I want to close with just that passage that we read yes, last Sunday from 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 10. Paul said this, and I just want to do this as a way to remind us. He said, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So your giving is sowing. When you give, you're not losing something, but you're releasing something to be multiplied. You understand that? So when you give, you don't have to feel like, oh no, something's gone away. No. You only released something for that to be multiplied. Now, in some places, Jesus put it like this in Matthew 10. He said, no man has left houses or mothers or fathers or mothers for my sake who will not receive a hundredfold now in this life. I mean, it's going to come back to you multiplied. Whatever you give, whatever you give up or give, uh, whatever you invest in his kingdom, it will come back to you. In Luke 6, 38, he said, give and it shall be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. So whenever you give, think of this. I'm releasing something to be multiplied back into my life. God will bring it back. Then verse 7, 
Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So as you purpose in your heart, cheerfully, not out of compulsion, not because you have to do it. Verse 8, God will make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things will abound to every good work. And this is what happens when you and I give. Verse 10, God supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. He will supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So God gives us seed to sow. He gives us bread to eat. He multiplies the seeds we sow and he increases the fruits. Amen? So, see, anytime something comes in your hand, remember, part of it is seed and part of it is bread. Eat the bread, but sow the when any fruit comes to your hands, remember the seed is in the fruit. Don't eat the fruit with the seed. Eat the fruit, but sow the seed. God designed it that way. So God gives seed to sow. He gives bread to eat. He multiplies the seeds we sow. He increases the fruits. He brings it back into your life. But every time fruit comes, remember... There is seed in the fruit. Eat the fruit, enjoy it, but sow the seed. Let it go back. Let that continuing, the sowing happen continually so that fruits can come out of your sowing. Now, when you give, give in faith. There may be times it may be a little difficult to give, but give anyway. There may be times when you may need to change your giving, how you give. Do it. Do it to honor God. Sometimes God may prompt you to do some, take big risks in your giving. Sometimes I've done some crazy giving. But you're blessing somebody and God will multiply it back in your life. He'll do it. So take, do it always in faith. Do it believing God. Do it knowing what you're doing. That you are sowing seed and you're releasing seed that will be multiplied back to your life. Amen? Let's stand to our feet, please. We're going to get ready to close. Uh, I'll just call our worship team up. We have some amazing testimonies come in. Recently, not too long ago, three different couples came and they said they had been trying for babies for quite a while. And um, over the course of the different Sunday services, this, the beginning, from the beginning of this year till now, three different couples, God gave them babies. Amen. And all of them have been trying for some time, but God blessed them. They came and shared testament. Another testimony came, and this, this happened some time back, but the testimony came in later. You know, uh, we have a church app, and I'm not saying all of you have to do this, but this is what this person did. I'm just sharing the testimony. Um, we were doing a series on healing uh, in our morning devotions, Living Supernaturally. Uh, this was some, some, some time back. And he was watching that, and he was praying with the prayer at the end of each of that message. And he wanted God to restore his eyesight. Okay? And God did it. And he's taken off his glasses. He's not wearing his glasses. His eyesight is... I'm not saying all of you have to do that. I'm just saying what happened to him. So last week I met him and he came and he shared this. I was like, his eyesight fully restored. He's not wearing glasses. He says, I don't need to wear it. My eyesight was restored while I was watching that program the morning devotionals. I mean, not morning, but the daily devotionals. So that happened through the church app. <laughs> right? Through the church app, the devotional to the church app. He was praying with that, and God restored his eyes. And, uh, and, and, and that amazing thing happened. Uh, so I just wanted to share those testimonies of different people 
receiving miracles as as we've been going along and they now and then they share the testimony and it's amazing to see uh what God is doing amen and i want to encourage you even as we pray prayers here in this you know in our services i want you to believe god have faith god can do anything he can heal all kinds of things and we want to press into that place where we see god we want you to we want to see you do amazing thing in our lives in our situations in our circumstances uh in 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 anything god can move he can change things amen believe god have god have faith in god to see things happen let's just worship god for a few minutes and then we will close please believe god to work in your life you know if you are in debt financial debt i want you to ask the lord saying god help me to obey you financially and i know you can provide i know you'll provide but i want to obey you god i want to start giving when you're in debt it is a little difficult to give i understand because you have your payments to make and all of that but if you just make a choice saying god i want to honor you with my giving i want to give whatever i can right now i want can you get me out of debt and as you start honoring god he will get you out of debt and he will bless you bless you financially god will do that i've seen him do it in my life and i can tell you he will do it in the lives of many many people So would you pray right now and say God I want to honor you financially And as I honor you bring me out of debt bring it out of debt supernaturally God will do it for you Father I pray for those of us God in this place who may be in difficult positions financially debt weighing in on us but this morning as we stand here we are asking you to help us honor you with our money to believe that you are a god who cares for us and you care even about our finances that little steps we take to honor you with our money god lord whatever they can do whatever the little steps to honor you Father I pray it will set miracles in motion to get people out of debt in their lives bring supernatural increase in the lives of people father let them receive unusual bonuses let them receive unexpected in pay increases let them receive lord unexpected cancellations of debt even as they take steps to honor you with their finances even though it might be difficult at this time even if they do it work miracles in their lives work miracles in their lives father we ask for your intervention in property matters god where there is disputes where there are court cases legal issues we ask for your intervention turn things around make it favorable for your people even as they begin to honor you financially do it in their lives intervene 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 God send for divine interventions God in property matters We thank you Lord thank you And Father I also pray right now for barrenness to be broken God for even as we heard at least three people come and testify you bless them with children this beginning of this year the course of this first half of the year father i pray for couples who are believing for children your presence is here father and you have said in your word no one shall be barren no one will suffer miscarriage or be barren among you so right now release lord the blessing of children for couples 
that are praying for children. Couples, just hold your hand as a sign of agreement to this prayer. And if by chance your spouse is not here, it's okay. You just pray anyway. But if you're believing God for children, if God will bless others, He is faithful, He'll do it for you. Let the miracle power of God touch their bodies right now. In Jesus' name. Father, and let children be born. As you've blessed others, bless these couples. Thank you, Lord. Barrenness is broken off of their household. In the name of Jesus, we release fruitfulness according to the word of God upon these homes, upon these households. In the name of Jesus, we give you thanks. We give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We also want to pray for job situations where people who have been stuck in Jobs, you've not had a pay raise for maybe three years. You've not seen an increase in your salary. And you've seemed like you're stuck in that job. But you don't have anywhere to go. You have no choice. Father, I pray that even as they begin to honor you financially. Let them see the blessing of God. Because you said you will pour out such a blessing. You won't have room enough to receive it. Your boss will not be able to stop it. Your company, your organization will not be able to stop it. God will pour out such a blessing on your life. Because he promised it in his words. So we release that blessing God upon those people. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My heart is yours. My heart is yours. Take it all. Take it all. My life in your hands. My heart is yours. My heart is yours. Take it all, take it all. My life in your hands. Take it all, take it all. My life in your hands. All to Jesus, I surrender. Father, we just thank you. We praise you for this time in your presence, for the word we could receive. God, for the miracles you wrought in our lives, that we will testify, God, to your goodness and your greatness in our lives. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let's close with a benediction, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.